This is One Man's Family. One Man's Family is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and to their bewildering offspring. Today transcribed, we present Chapter 1, Book 72, entitled Father Barber and His Three Sons. Six blocks straight down from the family home in Seacliff, San Francisco, it is early morning at the residence of Nicholas and Claudia Lacey. They are still up in their bedchambers, putting themselves together for the day. Claudia, where are my razor blades? What is it, Nicky? I can't hear you. What? Well, this is getting nowhere. Claudia, I Don't said... Don't shout, Nicky. I'm right here. <laughs> I'm sorry. A moment ago, you sounded at the other end of the corridor of time. What's the matter? My dear, I've lathered my face and prepared myself for the ordeal of shaving, and now I can't find a razor blade. I know there was some right here in the cabinet. Have you seen them? Did you look in the cabinet? Did I look at them? Dear girl, I just told you there were some in the cabinet, but not now. Where have they gone? Well, I'm sure I don't know, Nicky. When did you see them last? That's not going to help me shave this morning, I'm afraid. What difference does it make when I saw them last? Nicky, are you growling? No, darling, I just don't like to stand around with soap all over my face. Oh, well, let me look in the cabinet. Um, are they in a package or what? I have looked in the cabinet. There are no razor blades there. Well, wasn't there a blade in your razor? Claudia, if there had been a blade in the razor, I would have been shaved by now. <laughs> I'm a great help, aren't I? Not in the least. But most satisfyingly bewitching. May I have a before breakfast kiss? Nicky, you're covered with soap. Well, it's practically dry now. Turn around or I'll kiss the back of your neck. <laughs> Bend down and I'll kiss you on the forehead. Will that do? Oh, how chaste. Hmm, you're lucky to get that. <laughs> Somehow shaving soap doesn't appeal to me at this hour. There. Ah, thank you. Well, I suppose I could find a bit of broken glass and shave with that. Why don't you let it go till after breakfast? I think it would be nice if we got down in time to eat with Joan and Penny before they go off to school. I warn you, I'll look like a fugitive from a three-day binge. We'll forgive you. So be it. Are you ready to go down? Mm, I will be in a couple of minutes. Well, I'll just wash this soap off my face and... Uh-oh. What? The last razor blades. Mm. Where were they? Under this washcloth. <laughs> Nicky, that's the kind of thing Dad does. <laughs> I have no defense. I put them there myself and then laid the cloth on top. I'm mortified, chagrined, embarrassed, and properly apologetic. <laughs> that's enough. Wash your face. We have just... Hello. Who's yes? It? Who is it? Claudia, open the door. Well, it isn't locked. Come in, darling. Oh, well, I can't open it up. Well, oh, just a minute, Joan. What does she mean she can't open it? Why, Joan. Oh, look out, Claudia. This is heavy. Uh, Joan, what on earth? A breakfast tray. Well, here, let me help you. What goes on out there? Oh, it's all right. I've got it. How sweet and thoughtful of you. Um, here, on the bedside table. Okay. Nicky, come here. Who is it? Surprise. Joan. Good morning, fair one. Hurry up. Come out of the bathroom. And again, good morning. I didn't know you. What's this? Breakfast? Joan brought up our breakfast. Isn't that wonderful? Well, you'd better eat it. <laughs> this kind of breakfast doesn't wait. Ah, oh, yes. But first, would you permit a man whose face is covered with a stubble of beard to give you a kiss? Oh, sure. I kind of like a beard. You're an adorable child. You'd better hurry and eat it. I'm warning you. How about you? Oh, I've eaten already. Well, sit here and watch us. Mm, doesn't that smell marvelous, Claude? <laughs> Why didn't you let Mrs. McCullough help you with his heavy tray? Oh, she would have dropped it or something. Besides, I wanted to do it myself. Oh, I've got to get the coffee pot. I couldn't get it on the tray. I'll be right back. Nicky, we've got a new daughter. What's happened? Still under the influence of your Uncle Paul's spell. Do you suppose it will last? Mm, what a different house this is going to be if it does. Quite. And with it all, she's grown in beauty. It's the happy look in her face. The, the, the inner glow. Oh, I say we'd better eat her. She'll worry that it wasn't right. Ah, scrambled eggs. She's done them herself, too. I can tell Mrs. McCollop didn't. <laughs> yes, they don't have that professional look. <laughs> but I'll never eat scrambled eggs that I'll enjoy more. Mmm, delicious. Have you tasted them? Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Toast? Uh oh. She's burned it a little and scraped it off. Well, bless her heart, anyhow. Of course. Never in all her life would she ever have thought of making the effort before. Come on, eat. She might think we don't like it. Oh, I'm. I'm gorging myself <laughs> and loving it. <laughs> I didn't know she could boil water. <laughs> Where did she learn this? Mm, cooking breakfast for Paul this summer. We'll be internally indebted to the old boy for what he's done for Joan. I should think so. Oh, watch it. She's coming. Mm. Ah, coffee. Well, I hope this didn't get too strong. 
Maybe the coffee should have come first. Darling, the eggs are delicious. Oh, really? I cooked them myself. Well, you did something special. You can see what I thought of them. My plate's wiped clean. Oh, I'm glad. Oh, uh, hold your cup, Nicky. Uh, now yours, Claudia. Oh, I feel so luxurious being waited on like this. I don't think Mrs. McCullough liked it very much when I told her I was going to cook the breakfast. Invading her private domain, eh? Here, I'll um, take that coffee pot. I want it right here beside me. Okay. Was the toast all right? I, I burned it a little bit. Did you? Mm. Well, didn't notice a thing except perfection, myself. <laughs> We've eaten everything. That should be proof enough. And now tell us why did you do it? Hmm? Well, I don't know. I just guess I wanted to. We know, Joan. There was a lot of love in it. I, I hoped you'd think so. We knew at once. Paul says you can only get love if you give love. So I say, Joan, do you think you could stand another stubbly, bewhiskered kiss? <laughs> sure, why not? Now I really know what they mean by a big old hairy deal. (laughs) (laughs) And now six blocks in the other direction at the family home, it's a sparkling, sunny, fog-washed October morning. For 20 wonderful minutes, everything has been all right in Henry Barber's particular world. He came downstairs to find his morning paper beside his plate and his favorite breakfast awaiting him. More, he found good company at his table. Fanny, his wife, Paul and Cliff, his sons, and Skippy called Andy, his grandson. Cliff's boy, who is now installed in the family home. Father Barber was never more amiable for 20 minutes. But then, of course, things began to happen. Fanny hurriedly departed across the hedge to Jack and Betty's to look in on the triplets. Cliff left the table before he'd finished his coffee to get Andy off to school. And Paul put down his napkin to answer the telephone. Henry is now alone with the paper, and apparently he doesn't like the headlines. Murder, arson, war, bribery, wife-beating, desertion, cruelty to animals, treason, bigamy, and sin. Well, uh, what's that, Dan? Huh? Finish your call? Yes, yeah, just the airfield. Oh, look at these headlines. Well, what about them? What would it be like some sunny morning to come down to breakfast and find cheerful headlines in the newspaper? Hmm. For instance? Well, for instance, uh, man is true to his wife. <laughs> How's that? Or... Uh, Honest policeman refuses big bribe. Or how about a tottering old lady is kind to dogs? Or even a sinless Monday in San Francisco. <laughs> Wouldn't that leave the public open mouthed with amazement? Breathtaking. You suppose they'd sell any papers? Well, they'd go like hotcakes. I'd stand in line. You hardly represent circulation, Dad. <laughs> it would be a startling novelty. I, w- I wish they'd try it. Paul, there must be both good news and bad news on the teletypes. All they'd have to do someday is select all the good news and put it on page one and cheer everybody up. Oh, uh, who did you say that was on the telephone? Airport. Just business. Couldn't they call during business hours? Call hours are business hours for an airport. (laughs) Everybody coming and going hither and yon. And for what reason? Well, a good many people are trying to earn a living, you know. Couldn't they stay home and earn a living? Do they have to streak through the sky in airplanes to do it? (laughs) I didn't. Not in my day. I stayed right here. I made an ample living. Anybody can do it. I thought you started out pretty cheerfully this morning. I am cheerful, Paul. I'm in a splendid humor. Oh, that's great. Yes, sir. I do wish sometime we could have a leisurely breakfast with the whole family remaining at the table from orange juice right through to the second cup of coffee. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, what was Clifford fussing with Andy about? He wasn't fussing with him. He had to tell him twice to brush his teeth. Twice, yes, my day, we told them once, and that was that. You know, want some of the paper? No, oh, thanks. I've got to go. Go. You see? Everybody's always going I've some... got a job, Dad. We have a meeting this morning. A meeting? Eh? Yeah, a meeting of all my flying instructors. All three of them. Meeting? That's another thing. This is the most over-organized nation that ever tried to exist on the face of the earth. Do you know how many organizations there are in San Francisco? No. Do you? Yeah, we must run into the hundreds of thousands. Societies and clubs and councils and leagues and associations, lodges, luncheon clubs and dinner clubs, clubs for each day of the week and special clubs for holidays, committees within the clubs and symposiums when they all get together. (laughs) Nobody ever stays home. They're all off attending a meeting. The Girl Scout mothers have more meetings than the Girl Scouts do. 
And the PTA spends more time PTAing than the children spend in school, rushing hither and into meetings, meetings, meetings. <laughs> Nobody even has time for breakfast. What is this, a speech? Uh, Dad's doing a symposium on the ill effects of rushing your breakfast. Nothing of the kind. I'm merely making conversation. Sit down, Cliff. Sit down. Finish your coffee. <laughs> Nobody finishes his coffee. Uh, besides, I have more to say on the subject of meetings. Well, it's a little early for speeches, Dad. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me. I saw a very, very curious performance yesterday. I thought the boy had lost his mind. Uh, what boy? Pinky. He was down on the seawall late yesterday afternoon making ridiculous gestures. What? Gestures like this, shaking his fist, spreading his arms. Then he would hammer one fist into his palm. So I put down my gardening tools and strolled down there. What was he doing? He was talking to the ocean. Oh, hey, Dad. <laughs> he was, Clifford. He was talking to the ocean. I can almost quote him. There is an innate kindness in the human race, he was saying. Well, not word for word, of course, but this is what I remember of it. Uh, this, there is an innate kindness in the human race, especially among one's relatives, the wellsprings of which can be tapped with the pen. With the what? With the pen. He was making some reference to the fact that while he was away at the lumber camp this summer, his whole foolish family answered his letters and sent him money without telling one another. Including a grandfather who sent him $50. Oh, I, I, I didn't know other people were sending him money, Paul. You, you can't blame me for that. Anyway, that's besides the point. Do you suppose he has become a little unbalanced with his monetary successes? Huh? Does it seem normal to you to stand on the seawall and deliver impassioned remarks to the ocean? Well, did he see you down there? Of course he didn't see me, Clifford. He was too wrapped up in himself, shaking his fists at the waves, rounding out his periods. Did he have pebbles in his mouth? Who are you talking about? Well, some old Greek orator used to practice speeches at the seashore with pebbles in his mouth. The most of these, wasn't it? Maybe Pinky's running for office somewhere. Oh, running for office. Well, school <laughs> office, dad, class president, stuff like that. It's all very mysterious, if you ask me. Well, I'm going to run, if you'll excuse me. Yeah, and I've got a couple of chores downtown. Yes, you go somewhere. Get up and rush about. I might drop in on Dan and Hazel on my way downtown. See if I can solve your mystery, if you like. Huh? Oh, Daniel and Hazel. I haven't seen them since we got back from the Sky Ranch. In fact, I haven't seen half my family. Want some of the morning paper, Dan, to finish off your breakfast? Hmm? No, no thanks, Hazel. What have you got there? Looks like a manuscript. Fourteen double-spaced typewritten pages. I'll say it's a manuscript. Who wrote it? <laughs> Sit down, Hazel. Take hold of that table and hang on. Can I wait just a moment while I go bring in some fresh toast? Listen to this. There is an innate kindness in the human race, especially among one's relatives, the wellsprings of which can be tapped with a judicious pen. What is that you're reading, Dan? Listen, when a person discovers the power of the written word, there is no need for the following. One, loneliness. Two, poverty. Three, defeat. A well-written letter will bring an instant response by airmail. What in the world is it? Oh, dear, someone's at the door. Don't read any more till I get back. Sounds like Pinky, except it's much too well phrased. Never underestimate your own offspring, Hazel. Well, Cliff, good morning. Come in. Is there anybody in a temper over here? Don't tell me something's happened to upset Father. <laughs> Nothing but the morning paper. Hiya, Dan, old boy. Sit down, Cliff. What brings you out in the morning, do? Oh, thanks. Oh, I'm on my way downtown eventually. Uh, what's this about Father? I've made a wonderful observation about Dad now that I'm living at home again. He's always grousing because people don't stay together. <laughs> Gets sore if somebody leaves the table. He wants everybody around in the evening. But what happens when we are all together? You ever notice? What? He moves away. <laughs> yeah, he goes somewhere to be quiet. <laughs> now that you mention it, I think you're right. Oh, he just wants to know where everybody is. Oh, hey, have I interrupted family stuff? Oh. Oh, no, no, Pinky seems to have written something. Dan was just reading it to me. It's a speech. Oh, really? A speech, Dan? Mm -hmm. Our young son has abandoned all frivolity this season. He's gone out for the debating team. But, Dan, he hasn't said a word. Well, this is my first inkling this morning. Oh, as simple as that. Dad heard him practicing on the seawall yesterday. <laughs> he thought the, the boy had lost his senses. But the, the, the debating team, when did all this happen? Overnight. But why haven't I heard about it? Oh, it's too new and too beautiful. We had quite a man-to-man -man talk this morning while I was shaving. I wondered what was going on. I bet there's a gal behind it. <laughs> now, there's a shrewd observation. Feeling bright this morning, Clifford? Well, I can remember when I was Pinky's age. All my nobler impulses and loftier ambitions were inspired by some pretty little gal. Oh. Oh, yes, the ladies. I guess we just can't help it. The nature of the deer. Well, anyway, this morning, the whole burden of Pinky's remarks was this. 
The debating team is going to Fresno. All expenses paid for the first of a series of statewide speech contests. Pinky wants to go to Fresno? Well, an inattentive parent might have assumed so, that he was inspired by the prospect of a free overnight bus trip. But... Oh? But a girl's name kept creeping into the conversation. A girl's name and new big words like diminutive. Pinky didn't say diminutive. Oh, yes, yes. There's a fragile little girl with slate gray eyes, naturally curly, coal black hair, no fingernail polish. Oh, dear. No lipstick. In short, the sort of young lady we'd approve of. He's serious? You bet your life he's serious. At 16, what else? Ooh, but what about Pinky the playboy? Pinky who was never going to concentrate on only one woman. Yes, Dan, this is an utterly new Pinky. <laughs> Looks like Pinky somewhere in the lumber camps did something for him. For him or to him. What about this girl, Dan? Oh, well, she gave Pinky a copy of Roger's thesaurus of English words and phrases. We are about to be inundated with three-syllable synonyms. <laughs> if I recognize the signs, and who says I don't, we're going to live through another fascinating phase with William Herbert Murray, better known as Pinky. What's her name? Do we know her? Iris Rand. Iris Rand. Do we know any Rand? I don't. Kind of a pretty name, don't you think? Iris Rand. Yes, that's rather striking. But Dan Pinky can't make speeches. Well, how do you know he can't? He worked like a Trojan on this manuscript. What's more, it isn't bad. Oh, I'll get it. Excuse me, Claire. He's going to deliver it in assembly this morning. And if he's good enough, he'll join the debating team and ride in a bus to Fresno with the lovely, diminutive, curly-haired Miss Iris Rand, who wears no fingernail polish. Hello? Oh, Pinky. Uh, what? Well, how'd you happen to forget a thing like that? Well, what time is it now? Very well, Pinky. I... Yes, Dan's still here. Yes, he will. Dan, get your hat. What's that, Pinky? Well, all right, I'll tell him. I think I'm going somewhere, Cliff. <laughs> Sounds like something's cooking. Dan, the manuscript, he forgot it. Well, I told you he was in a daze. He can't make a speech without it. Oh, please, hurry right over to the high school. He'll be waiting under the clock in the main hall near the principal's office. <laughs> all right, Hazel. Yeah, there's one thing love never did inspire, Clifford. What's that? Efficiency. Pinky's whole immediate future hangs on this manuscript. So in his blissful state, he naturally forgot it. Cliff, do you suppose Dan stayed to hear the speech? Hmm? What time is it? 10.15. Well, sure he did. Why not? Well, I would have. I might stand behind a post where I wouldn't be seen, but I'd have stayed and listened. Isn't it astonishing? You worry about these youngsters, you think they're never going to show any sensible drive or ambition, and then overnight something like this happens. It hasn't happened to Andy. It will. You'll find there's more fun in watching your son unfold and spread his wings than in anything you've ever done in your life. You and Dan have an easy, offhand way with the kids. I don't know, it must be a knack or something. Doggone him. What's the matter? Oh, I had to crack down on Andy this morning. What for? Teeth. You mean, have you brushed your teeth, that one? Mm. Yeah, every morning, Hazel. When he comes down to breakfast, I have to say, have you brushed your teeth, Andy? And what does he answer? Usually he snaps his fingers and says, oh, gosh, no, I forgot, Dad. Tell me this, how can he comb his hair and wash his face and still forget to brush his teeth? Oh, that's simple. Boys don't live in this world at all. They don't? Well, no. They live on ranches fighting rustlers or in darkest Africa shooting elephants or they ride jet-propelled airplanes and explore the mountains on the moon. <laughs> they think they're with you, but they're really not. Why, boys live in another dimension entirely, Cliff. No toothbrushes in that dimension, of course. None. They're pure, disembodied spirit. They can go anywhere. I'm going to try to remember that. You know what I dream of? What, Cliff? I want to see my son actually like me, be easy with me. I don't think I was ever easy with Dad. Nowadays, of course, when he blows off steam, I'm amused. I know he doesn't mean it, but when I was a youngster, he used to scare the life out of me. Not really, though. I could never predict his reactions. I'd like Andy to feel that he always knew where I stood. Oh, I've got to be on my way if I'm still going downtown. Well, we haven't had a visit like this in a long time. Yeah. Let me know what happened to Pinky. Oh, well, Dan ought to be here now, any minute. I'd like to wait, Hazel, but I really can't. Uh, how's Roberta, Cliff? Mm. I haven't seen her lately. She's, uh, busy? Yeah. Well, I'll be seeing you. Oh, wait. Uh, that's Dan's car coming now. Wait a minute. He looks pleased about something. Did you hear the speech, Dan? Hi, Hazel. How'd it go? Don't tell me that grin means it was a sensation. My friends, I saw her. What? Clifford, wouldn't you say that Hazel's lovely? And Betty and Claudia... We have handsome women in our family. Oh, bet you, 100%. Well, they've all got to move over now. <laughs> Why? I saw Miss Iris Rand. 
Hazel, she's a honey. Diminutive's exactly the word. She's no bigger than a minute. Why, she's the prettiest little girl I ever saw in my life. And ten, you're adult. All right, wait till you see her. That son of ours has taste and good judgment, Hazel. And talent? I sneaked into the back of the auditorium and heard her make a speech. It was, well, something. A little bit of a girl about that big and the loveliest voice you ever heard. But Pinky, Dan, what about Pinky's speech? Huh? Oh, oh, yes, yes, Pinky's speech. Uh, oh, sure. Well, how was it? Yeah. Uh, well, it, it was his first try. Hmm. Needed another afternoon on the seawall, maybe, huh? Dan, don't tell me he didn't make the team. Oh, well, they won't know about that for a day or two. But I will tell you this. He's found himself a girl. Yes, sir. The only way he'll keep ahead of Iris Rand is to get himself elected to the presidency of the United States. She's a winner if I ever saw one. <laughs> and the competition's going to be terrific. Cliff, don't say anything yet to mother and father about this, will you? Okay, why not? I never report anything but success to Father if I can help it. So that's the secret of your success. No wonder you've always been his favorite child. So Father Barber is not to hear of Pinky's debacle as a public speaker for some weeks to come. Unaware at this phase of family life, he sits this evening with Paul before the library fire. Yes, sir. Paul, would you stir up the fire a bit? Yeah, sure, Dad. I don't think it needs another log, do you? Oh, oh, that'll be fine. Sit down, boy. Sit down. Hasn't Clifford got Skip uh, Andrew to bed yet? He'll be down a little. Yes, yes. Don't you want to smoke your pipe, Paul? Well, sure. You usually complain of the smell. Oh, go ahead. None of the women are around. I'd like to have you smoke it once in a while. On an evening like this, for example, with a pleasant fire, I don't mind it at all. In fact, it gives me a kind of a mellow feeling. Mom will come home, take one sniff, and raise holy head. <laughs> well, you seem to be very satisfied with life tonight. Well, why not? I see the lives of my children and all my family smoothing out once more. Clifford back home with us. My sons all doing well. My daughters happily married. Yes, yes, that's comforting to a man, Paul. Mm, I can imagine. Yes, yes. We, we haven't had a good talk together for some time. Uh, I enjoy talking to you this way. Yes, it is sort of pleasant not to feel that we're at odds over something. Seemed to me we were at each other most of the summer. Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. We stimulate each other. That's well, what... well, that's one way of putting it, Dad. But it seemed to me we were at it pretty hot and heavy several times. Oh, maybe a slight difference of opinion now and then. But that means nothing. Life would be dull if everybody went around uh, agreeing on everything. We certainly found plenty to disagree on about Joe, no question about that. You had me on the hot seat most of the time. Huh? Hot seat? What does that mean? Now, Dad, don't play innocent with me. You know perfectly well that if everything hadn't turned out all right with Joan, I never would have heard the last of it. Why, you fought me every inch of the way to get her away from here and back up to the Sky Ranch with Nicky and Claudia. Well, was that such a terrible attitude to take? Joan is their daughter. But won't you agree that Joan's stay here and having that job has worked wonders for her? Mm -hmm. Yes, you. Let's face it, Dad. You were pretty rough on her and that boy. And by the way, haven't you changed your mind about him somewhat now that you've met him? I just saw him up at the Sky Ranch that one weekend. I can't say that I know the fellow well enough to be able to judge him. <laughs> You're a... Hi, anybody home? Huh? Sound like Jack. We're in the library. Come on in. I hear you. I'm coming. Did you bring your mother home with you? Hi, Dad. No, she's over at the house with Betty and Nicolette talking babies. I thought I'd come over here to see if anybody was around. Yeah, it seems to me your mother spends most of her time over at your house. I guess you'll have to move Jack and the triplets back here if you want to see anything of her, huh, Dad? It looks that way. Gosh, it's good to get around some men for a while. I get a little fed up with that bib and diaper talk. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Cliff? Oh, he's up getting Andy settled for the night. I guess he had to read to him for a bit. <laughs> the fuss he makes over one kid. What would he do with six? Well, Cliff has to make up for a lot, Jack. He doesn't remember how he neglected Andy, but it's been brought home to him so forcibly he's trying to make up for all 11 years in a hurry. Uh, afraid he'll spoil the boy the way he's going. I'd say he could stand some spoiling. He's been a very lonely little boy. I don't believe I ever make a statement that Paul doesn't take exception to it. <laughs> hey, don't tell me you two have been at it again. At what again? Arguing, Dad. That's about all you did all summer. All right, me? You especially. What was the matter anyway? I've never seen you as fussy and grumpy as you were all during vacation. Who said so? Everybody in the family. Gosh, there was hardly a person you didn't have a set to about something. Right, Paul? Well, just before you came, I was taking the task about Joan. I thought it was fairly unreasonable in her case, certainly. And about Ken, too. Sure, Dad. You simply wouldn't listen to anything good about Ken. 
You were prejudiced against him right from the start, and from then on, he was a condemned man. Has it reached the point where a person isn't allowed to voice an opinion in this family? Well, you voiced yours, but plenty. <laughs> I had hoped to have a quiet and peaceful evening here by the fire, but it seems to oh, be... Oh, here comes Cliff. Come on and get in on a good old family clam bake, Cliff. Oh, hi, Jack. What's going on down here? We've been tearing Dad apart. In a nice way, of course. Or don't you agree with that, Dad? What's the matter, Dad? They roughing you up a little? <laughs> sit down, my boy. Sit down. Yes, yes. Well, I haven't been together like this with my three sons alone in a long, long time. Well, I want to know what the beef's all about. Oh, beef. I don't like to hear a grown man use slang. Okay, Dad, the argument. Uh, there was no argument that I was aware of. It seems that Jack and Paul are of the opinion that I overstepped myself on several occasions this summer and caused some hurt feelings. <laughs> well, are you denying it? Huh? Are you taking up the cudgel against me too, Clifford? But, Dad, look at look the way you went after poor little Margaret. Well, what did I do to Margaret, pray? Just practically broke her heart, that's Nothing all. Nothing of the sort. Teaching my granddaughter a muchly needed lesson. Why, she understood that. She did? Oh, certainly. Margaret and I have perfect understanding. That wasn't the way I heard it. The family grapevine says she tried to make up and you turned her down cold. Yeah, then started making a big play for Sharon Ann. <laughs> Dad, we got you in a corner now. How about it? Oh, I, 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 I was doing what I thought was best for Margaret, simply applying a bit of child psychology. <laughs> what psychology book did you get that out of? Uh, book indeed. I don't need any book to know how to handle children. Uh, I have considerable practical knowledge on that subject. You have only to look about you to know that. Just the same, you're going to have quite a time squaring yourself with Margaret the way I hear it. Is that so now? Sure. Girl Margaret's age is sensitive. Is he? You don't believe it? Don't you represent the group who has maintained that I spoil the girl? Eh? And now you sit here and tell me what an ogre I am. Where's the sense in that? Eh, we're wasting our time. He's going to go along to just as he thinks, regardless of what we say. Well, I must give my son's credit for one thing this evening. Gentlemen, attention. Our father is about to pay us a compliment. <laughs> I don't know whether you call it a compliment or not. Uh-oh, false alarm. <laughs> what I was going to say was that you have been most frank with me. We were half kidding, though. You know that. <laughs> half joke, whole earnest, no doubt. And I must confess that I admire you all for being so forthright. A father can be wrong, too, and... I'm glad that you respect me enough to make, uh, uh, shall we say, suggestions the way you have. It, it'll give me something to think about at any rate. Spoken like a man, Dad. Right. You can dish it out, but you can take it too, huh, Dad? <laughs> That's pretty slangy for a grown man, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... I got it. Hello. Oh, hi, Adam. We're just sitting here chewing the fat. Hmm? Oh, Dad and Cliff and Jack. <laughs> Man talk. Sure, he's right here. Just a second. It's Hazel. Someone's wants to talk to you, Dad. Here. Thank you. Hello. Oh, just fine, my dear. What's that? Tomorrow? Why, yes, of course. Oh, oh, oh. I, I'd be delighted. <laughs> In fact, I'm especially delighted. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you later. No, no, that's delightful. Listen to him purr. Very well, my dear. Yes. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> yeah. well, she must have had good news for you, Dad. Oh, nothing out of the ordinary. Well, we're not going to coax you. It was just Hazel calling to say that Margaret wanted her to be sure and call me to see if I'd save tomorrow afternoon for her. Just her and me. What's this? Hey, Dad, you mean the rumors have all been wrong? You've made up? Yeah, it wasn't a question of making up. Oh, Dad. Not at all. We simply came to an understanding quite some time ago. Well, why didn't you tell us? Yeah, yeah we've been knocking ourselves out trying to get you two together again. And you had already done it. <laughs> yeah. You boys read the books and let your father go along in his old-fashioned way. I'll muddle through. <laughs> <laughs> just heard the opening chapter of Book 72 of One Man's Family, written, produced, and transcribed under the direction of Carlton E. Morse. Chapter 2, entitled Clifford Delves into His Past, will come to you next week at this same hour. Monday is the night for music on NBC. And Monday is more than ever a musical treat on NBC because starting tomorrow night, you can hear the Railroad Hour. 30 minutes of your favorite show tunes on most of these NBC stations. 
Remember, Monday means music and the Railroad Hour on NBC. You're tuned for the stars on NBC. NBC.